I want to welcome you all to the webinar today. Thank you for attending. My name is Ken Kaiser, and I am the marketing coordinator at Scientific Bioprocessing. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar, and I'm excited to welcome our speaker, Daniel Peñarete. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Texas A&M University. Uh, Daniel received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering uh, and microbiology uh, from Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. Sorry if I butchered that. Uh, then uh, you know, for, for graduate school, he embarked on a journey to emulate human tissues with organ on a chip technology. As part of this journey, uh, he has characterized oxygen behavior in a microfluidic device that aims to mimic physiological oxygen microenvironments. So today he's gonna be sharing the insights that he obtained so far by using the SBI ID Developers Kit. So again, please feel welcome to leave comments uh, and questions in the chat box. Uh, today's webinar is a pre-recorded presentation that Daniel was kind enough to give us, and it will be followed by a live Q&A with Daniel, who is here on the line. Um, Jake Boy, who is a senior application scientist with us at Scientific Bioprocessing, he's also here, um, and he can address any questions you may have um, about the technical aspects of our sensor technology. Um, and you, you know, you'll also receive the webinar by email within the next 24 hours. And so uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank you all again for attending and uh, we're gonna begin. Hello, my name is Daniel Peñarete and I am a PhD candidate from the German lab in the Department of Biomedical and Chemical Engineering in Texas A&M University. I would like to start by thanking you all for attending this webinar. Today we will be talking about oxygen quantification in organ on a chip technology. And in particular, in particular I'll be sharing my experience uh, using the ID Developers Kit by scientific bioprocessing to characterize oxygen behavior in a microfluidic device. Oxygen distribution in organs and tissues is very uneven, as you can see in these um, graphs. So that unevenness is characteristic of oxygen distribution in both organs and within tissues. For example, in terms of organs, you see that uh, the highest oxygen concentration in the body is in arterial blood, while the lowest one is in organs like muscle. At the same time, in, within an organ, there's differences in oxygen tension, tension between the tissue that make part of that organ. So for example, in the case of intestinal tissue, we have a highly oxygenated soft mucosal component where the vascular component of the tissue is. And then as we move towards the lumen of the organ, we see a continuous drop in oxygen concentration um, to the point where there's high, severe hypoxia and even anoxia in the lumen of the small intestine. Now that's very interesting because within this organ, uh, there's interaction between different cell types of different tissues. So for example, in the case of intestinal tissue, these intestinal epithelial cells are experiencing the anoxia that's characteristic of the lumen of the organ, while these fibroblast and stromal cells are experiencing a higher degree of oxygenation while they interact with these epithelial cells. And at the same time, these fibroblasts and these epithelial cells are sending signals to the vasculature of the of the tissue um, which is highly oxygenated and so this is what triggered us to uh, design a microfluidic device in order to mimic these oxygen gradients within tissue in order to study the interaction between different cell types this is the microfluidic device that we have designed it contains uh, four co-culture chambers and within each one of these co-culture chambers as you can see in this cross-sectional view, there is four layers. So the, out, the upper and lower layers are reserved for continuous media perfusion. And then the middle layers are reserved for um, culture of different cell types, as you can see in this image. And these cell culture layers are divided by translucent polyester membranes whose uh, porosity can be changed in order to modulate the degree of interaction between the two cell types. And so 
in this trip, we wanted to develop an oxygen gradient, as you can see in this image, by continuously perfusing well oxygenated media through the bottom compartment and anoxic media through the upper compartment of the chamber. And so this continuous perfusion would create an oxygen gradient through the copultured chambers that will provide more oxygen to one of the cell types than to the other one, uh, and that is intended to mimic the oxygen gradients that are found in organs and tissues. Now, in order to test this oxygen generation, oxygen gradient generation hypothesis, we decided to use the ID developers kit by scientific bioprocessing. This kit offers real-time non-invasive monitoring of oxygen and pH, and it's very convenient in terms of uh, microfluidics. Those that are used are very small, are pre-calibrated, and they are disposable sensors that are convenient for single-use microfluidic devices. The sensors also offer a full measurement range from zero to 100% oxygen saturation with high accuracy and high resolution. This is what the setup looks like. So the culture vessel um, is right here with the sensor spot and it lays on uh, the ID reader, which is this black disc over here, which is the one that's sending signal and detecting signal back from the sensors. And then that signal is being transmitted to an ID converter in which it's converted to readings that are finally sent to a computer for uh, their analysis. This is what the sensing technology looks like. The sensors, as I mentioned, are very small. They're pretty easy to um, handle and uh, um, they're disposable, which is very convenient in this case. And something very interesting and very convenient about this system as well is the fact that each one of the readers has two um, sensing positions, as you can see in these images, these two dots over here. And so this is convenient for traditional cell culture vessels because it allows you to monitor both oxygen and pH at the same time from a single vessel. And in terms of microfluidics, in our case in particular, it was also very convenient because it allowed us to sample the oxygen tension at two different points in the device at the same time during the same experiment. And so um, in this into account, we incorporated, we incorporated the sensor spots into the device. This is a top view of the device, which is made of oxygen permeable, of gas permeable PDMS. You can see how one of the sensor spots is in one of the chambers and it's located on the upper channel. So right here in that chamber, while the other one is in another chamber and it's located in the bottom um, channel, right next to the oxygen channel. And so this was very convenient once again, because in a single run, we could characterize what was happening in both anoxic and oxic channels. Um, in terms of use, the sensors adhered pretty well to bare PDMS. And so that was convenient because we didn't have to use any additional glue. We didn't have to worry about the biocompatibility of that glue. Um, and the placement was, was very, very easy as well. And uh, something also that is very worth mentioning is the fact that for reading the signal coming from the upper sensor, uh, the signal from the reader had to go through three polyester membranes, as I explained before. And not only that, but it also had to go through more than one millimeter of media and one millimeter of PDMS right here at the bottom that's still in the device. And so even though the signal has to overcome all these obstacles before it can reach the sensor, and then it has to do it again as the signal from the sensor is coming back, um, we were able to obtain high quality measurements from this upper sensor spot by adjusting the brightness in the reader. And so um, in that sense, we were able to obtain these simultaneous measurements, even though the device, the, the design of the device seemed to be an obstacle. Now, uh, something else that's worth mentioning be before I talk about our results is the fact that this microfluidic device is operated inside an anaerobic chamber, and the anaerobic chamber is pressurized. It has positive pressure. 
And so that was inconvenient in our case because the device itself has higher dimensions than a regular microfluidic device. And um, if you take into account the flow rate, that means that <clears throat> the, the inner pressure of the device was not as high as it gets to be in devices with smaller dimensions, with, with features with smaller, with smaller features. And so when we operated the device inside the anaerobic chamber, we observed a lot of bubble formation, uh, which was caused due to the, the action of the positive atmosphere pressure on the channels of the device. And so the way we overcame this issue was by covering the device with water, uh, because that water basically acts as a barrier that, um, that prevented the direct action of the atmosphere in the anaerobic chamber on the chip. And so thanks to that um, little trick, we were able to operate this device inside the anaerobic chamber without bubble formation. Before we tried to characterize the oxygen behavior in our device, we did validate the sensors after they were exposed to some treatments. The sensors have to be incorporated in the device during the building process, and therefore they will be exposed to some of the forces that we use, to some of the techniques that we use in order to build the device, right? And so in this device in particular, we need to perform plasma treatment for 30 watts, at, at 30 watts of power for 10 minutes, and then we have to do baking for two hours at 60 degrees. And so we were, we were curious about whether these two treatments will have any impact in the behavior of the sensors. And that's why we compared the static and the dynamic response of the sensors of untreated and treated sensors um, when taking readings. And so right here on the left, you can see the final values that the sensors reached when they were placed in a normox incubator covered with tap water. And you can see that the final value of the treated versus untreated sensors are very, very similar. So we did not see an effect of the treatment in the static um, readings of the, of the sensors. At the same time, when we talk about the dynamic behavior of the sensors, <clears throat> uh, we had these sensors in the Petri dish covered in water, and then we brought them into the anaerobic chamber, and the, sense the, the water just lost all of its oxygen. That's right here at the beginning of the experiment. And then we replace the water that's covering the sensors with oxygenated water right here in the red arrow. And when we do that replacement inside the anaerobic chamber, we observed the expected increase um, in oxygen readings coming from the sensor. Now, at some point, that water that's covering the sensor is lost to the anaerobic atmosphere. Um, and so the concentration of oxygen that's read by the sensor once again drops. And you can repeat this multiple times, basically. Um, and that's the dynamic response of the sensor that we wanted to validate. And so we run that experiment with both the untreated sensor and the treated sensor. And we observe very similar dynamic behavior of the sensors, even though this one had been treated with plasma and baked for a prolonged period of time. And so with these two tests, we validated that the sensor performance was not affected by the methods that are used for building microfluidic devices, such as prolonged baking and plasma treatment. And so this basically gave us green light um, to perform our experiment with the device. After the sensors were validated and incorporated into the device, we tested the hypothesis of whether the oxygen gradient could be formed in the chip by this continuous perfusion of oxygenated water here and anoxic water here. And so the chip uh, that you can see right here at the bottom is on top of the reader and it's covered in water. It's brought into the anaerobic chamber and then a continuous perfusion with um, water starts at 10 microliters per minute through these two outer channels. So these are the results that we obtained from this experiment. As you can see the chips are here introduced in the device in, in the anaerobic chamber at the red arrow. And then uh, the oxygen concentration in the system continuously drops with time as it loses oxygen to the atmosphere of the anaerobic chamber. 
Um, unfortunately, even though the system was being continuously perfused with oxygenated water, we observed that the system continuously lost oxygen until um, after 25 hours of operation inside the anaerobic chamber when the system became basically anoxic, um, even though it was being perfused with oxygenated water. And so thanks to the use of the ID developers kit, we found out that the oxygen gradient was not being formed uh, inside the microfluidic device as we expected when, this, when the device was being perfused at a rate of 10 microliters per minute. Now there's uh, two possible causes for this unexpected result. The first one is the fact that PDMS is highly permeable to oxygen. And then if you combine that with a relatively low uh, media flow rate uh, and the consequent high residence time of liquid in the system, um, these two things merge and the consequence is that the water, the oxygenated water that we, went, that we were injecting into the device was losing all of its oxygen before it could reach the co-culture chambers. And so this, uh, but we did confirm that we could generate this oxygen gradient if we increased the flow rate of uh, water. So as you can see in this graph, the device is fully anoxic when it's being perfused at 10 microliters per minute. But then if we increase the perfusion rate tenfold uh, to 100 microliters per minute, we see that oxygen um, saturation percentages increase in the oxygen channel. Now, unfortunately, as soon as we stop this flow rate and bring it down to 10 microliters per minute, we once again see that oxygen stops being able to reach the co-culture chambers. So this result basically confirmed that an oxygen gradient can be formed in our device, um, but unfortunately it requires a very high flow rate. And this flow rate is not feasible for us using our current setup of a syringe pump for a long-term uh, co-culture in the magnitude of days. And so after seeing these results, we were curious as to whether we could try to recapitulate other sorts of oxygen heterogeneity by using a wire device. And so I'll just briefly describe two other promising strategies that we evaluated um, thanks to the uh, ID developers kit in our system. So the two strategies that I will talk about are cyclical oxygenation and oxygen loss rate modulation. Now, when I talk about cyclical oxygenation, I'm referring to the phenomenon that happens in some tissues uh, during certain pathologies. For example, during tumor development, when tumor cells are quickly proliferating, they usually run out of oxygen. And that's because the vasculature that supplies oxygen to those cells just cannot keep up with the high demand of a very dense and highly proliferative cancerous tissue. After the run of oxygen, the tissue becomes hypoxic and even anoxic. But then over time, these cells send signals to the vasculature in order to uh, induce angiogenesis. And this new vasculature that's formed inside the tumor, once again, is able to provide oxygen to these tumor cells. And so this is the kind of behavior that we wanted to try to simulate in our system. And in order to do that, since our system was losing oxygen um, after 24 hours inside the anaerobic chamber, we tried by replacing the water that's covering the device with oxygenated water. And so at the very beginning of the experiment, as you, as you uh, as I have mentioned before, the system loses oxygen within 24 hours. And then at this point, we replaced the water covering the device with uh, oxygen that's 100% saturated with water that's 100% saturated in oxygen. And what we observed is that that water, uh, the content, the oxygen content in that water starts diffusing into the device through the PDMS that it's made of and it causes a peak in the oxygen readings in both the upper and the lower chambers. Now, as that water covering device loses its oxygen to the atmosphere in the anaerobic chamber, uh, it becomes anoxic once again, and then the oxygen that was able to reach 
the chambers starts diffusing out as well. And that's why we see a decrease in the oxygen readings once again. We also confirmed that the height of this peak that we were able to produce is directly proportional to the oxygen saturation in the water that we use for covering the devices. That is, if the water that we cover the devices with is 10% uh, of oxygen saturation, the peak that we observe in the co-culture chambers is very small. But then as you increase the oxygen saturation in that water, the peak starts getting larger and larger. And so that was a very interesting result because that means that we can modulate the length of this um, oxygen fluctuation by doing something as simple as replacing the water that's covering the devices. The next strategy that we tried to test was modulation of oxygen loss rate. And so this is uh, important in case some pathologies uh, want to be studied studied which differ in the rate in which tissue loses oxygen it's very different to study the response of uh, cells to a sharp loss in oxygen for example during a stroke uh, compared to a chronic uh, slow depletion of oxygen that is characteristic of tumor development and so for that reason we wanted to see if we could modulate the oxygen loss rate in our chip and so for this we tested two different methods. The first one was by changing the oxygen content in the water reservoir. And so here we have a chip that's introduced in the anaerobic chamber. If the chip is not covered in water, it very sharply loses all of its oxygen within a few hours and it becomes fully anoxic. If the chip is covered with anoxic water, the rate of oxygen loss is decreased and that's basically because this oxygen, this anoxic water is acting as a barrier uh, for oxygen that's trying to diffuse out of the chip into the atmosphere. If the water that's covering the devices is fully oxygenated, on the other hand, the oxygen loss rate is even slower just because this water is acting as a source of oxygen for the device. And uh, before oxygen can diffuse from the device into the atmosphere, that water, that oxygen that's con that, that, that oxygen that is present in the water covering the device needs to be lost to the atmosphere. So it acts as a super barrier to oxygen diffusion. And that's why it presents the lowest oxygen loss rate in our system. And finally, the second approach that we used was uh, the modulation of water level in the of the water level that's covering the device. And so once again, if the chips are not covered in any water, you see a very sharp drop in the oxygen concentration in the system. As you add more and more water, you see that the oxygen loss rate decreases just because of the same uh, barrier behavior of this column of water. So if you have a lot of water, uh, that's basically going to be a barrier that's going to slow down the loss of oxygen from the chip into the atmosphere of the anaerobic chamber. And so what's very valuable about these results and the results that I have shown before is that all of them agree well with the phenomenology, the phenomenology of oxygen um, transfer in microfluidic systems. Um, they agree well with our hypothesis as to um, how the permeability, the oxygen permeability of PDMS will affect its behavior in the chip. And so the results obtained with the ID developers kit are basically as expected for our experiments. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude that the ID developers kit is compatible with protocols commonly employed with microfluidics, as we did not see an effect of, on, of plasma treatment and prolonged baking on the behavior of the sensors. The kit can also be used for simultaneous measurement at two different points in a microfluidic device, which was very convenient in our case. And it, the kit also gives robust results that agree well with the expected behavior of oxygen in microfluidic systems. Uh, by using the ID developers kit, we were able to first of all test our any, any initial hypothesis of oxygen gradient generation 
And secondly, we were able to evaluate two additional strategies to control the oxygen microenvironment in a microfluidic device for, for, for culturing of different cell types. Uh, with that, I would like to um, acknowledge the team of scientific bioprocessing for their invaluable support during these experiments. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, Texas A&M University because this work was partially supported by the Rain Nesbitt Chair Endowment to Professor Jay Raman from Texas A&M. Um, I would like to thank you for attending this webinar and I am open now to questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, Daniel, you can feel free to turn your camera on now uh, for the Q&A. And to our audience, uh, please feel free to put your questions into the chat box. And uh, again, we have Daniel and uh, our application scientist, Jake Boy here to answer any technical questions about the sensors and technology that uh, Daniel was just speaking about. And um, also just want to mention too, we encourage anybody interested in using this technology for their experiments, uh, to also just leave your uh, email into the chat box as well so that we can get back to you and um, get the solution that's right for you. And uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you. Daniel, nice to see you. Thank you. I, I do have one question here uh, for you, Daniel, um, and it is, are there any concerns with raising flow rates to 100 microliters per minute in terms of too high shear stress on the cells, or is that still within uh, an acceptable range with your system? Um, the shear stress that will be, can you hear me well? Yeah. I can hear you, yeah. The, stress shear, the shear stress that the cells will experience uh, depends not only on the flow rate that you are using into your device, but also on the dimensions of the channels where the cells are. So technically, uh, you can increase the flow rate as much as you want, as long as the dimensions of the channel increase accordingly in order to maintain a stable shear stress. Um, so that's that's on that side. I have seen uh, many devices in which the shear stress are, is considerably low, um, higher than the one that we are using right now. And that usually has to do with devices in which they try to mimic the biomechanical properties of tissue. Uh, there are cells that are well adapted to very high shear stress, in particular um, cells in the vasculature that I can think of. And so depending on your application, you might want or not to um, increase the shear stress. The, the other thing that is very important to take into account in terms of flow rate in these systems is that um, depending on the techniques that are used for manufacturing the device, the device just might not be able to hold such a high flow rate because as you increase the flow rate, that's also going to increase the internal pressure in the device. And so um, it, it is concerning if you try to pump 10 ml per minute into one of these chips that everything might just explode. Uh, and that depends on the manufacturing that you used. But yeah, those are those are the main considerations when it comes to shear stress in these systems. Thanks. Uh, I have a question from Terry, and uh, the question is Daniel and Jake, not directly related to the developer's kit, but in general, I often see cross-sectional images of spheroids in publications claiming the center of large spheroids is hypoxic, but it is not mentioned how the oxygen level was measured. Is there a reliable way to measure oxygen concentration in the center versus the outside of a spheroid that requires uh, 10 to 20 microliters uh, resolution for measurement? Hmm. That's, a, that's a very nice question because I have struggled with that before. Um, and that's because I think that the person who asked this question realizes that it is, it is Often, it's, it's very frequently said in these spheroid papers that the, that the core of spheroids are hypoxic, but finding those measurements is much more complicated. Uh, I did find, I have found a couple of references in which the, the core of spheroids, and not only the core, but the entire cross-section 
um, is, is characterized in terms of oxygen distribution. And the way they did it was by micro electrodes. So these are very small electrodes that fit in a needle and they basically are able to hold the massive steroid. They hold it in place and they slowly injecting, inject the micro electrode as if it was um, in vitro fertilization. And then uh, they just keep sampling oxygen as they go into the spheroid. Uh, that's, that's the technology that I know uh, for, for getting that data. Um, now, if it's of any use, um, I can definitely share that, that information. I can also confirm that according to those experiments um, in their system, at least, the core of the spirit becomes fully anoxic after 200 micrometers, um, after you go into the spirit for 200 micrometers. Um, that's what I can tell you about, about that phenomenon. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very, very nice question to, to, to answer. Do, do, you, do you have anything to add, Jake? Daniel, that was awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that you answered that. It was in much more detail than I could have given. Um, all I really know is that we get a lot of people asking this exact same question. How do you measure um, the inside of a spheroid? And, you know, it's not possible with our technology. Um, we have ideas similar to what Daniel just mentioned. And, you know, one potential, um, I've heard of people using glass fiber optic needles and then taking the measurements optically using something like that. But again, it would be the same thing. You have to stab the spheroid essentially um, mm. to get that measurement. But yeah, as far as I know, there's not a widely known or widely accepted way to, to measure um, the inside of these things right now. That's true. Let me also add something. I'm sorry, I know that I talk too much about these things, but I really like them. Uh, I, I listened to this uh, researcher the other day and they were trying a very interesting approach in which they had microspheres that had fluorescent dye. Um, and so that they could use to measure oxygen by uh, oxygen fluorescent quenching. Um, and then what they did was they had an initial small spheroid, then, then they would add microspheres to that spheroid. The microspheres would stick to the surface of the spheroid, and then they would set an extra layer of cells. Um, and that way um, they could modulate where the where the microspheres were inside the spheroid, right? And then if I have three spheroids, and I know that in this spheroid, the microspheres are in the, at the surface. In this one, they're like closer to the middle of the, of the radius. And then in this one, they're at the very, very core. Then I can just measure oxygen in each one of them separately and try to obtain a profile through the cross-section of the spheroid. That's another possible strategy for doing that. That's great, thank you. Um, I, I do have another question from Alicia Hen. Uh, have you thought about using a non-oxygen permeable material for the device, except for between the channels? Yes, I have. Um, the reason why we started, why we designed this device using PDMS is just because it's so convenient in, in terms of uh, prototyping, right? You can easily print a 3D mold if you have access to a uh, soft light, like, soft light photography facility. You can also very easily prototype devices are cheap when you make them with PDMS and you can just throw them away when you're done, done with your experiment. Uh, but I can tell that some of the uh, best results that I've seen of oxygen manipulation in these chips are from chips that use uh, materials like polycarbonate or um, acrylic in order to make sure that the system is isolated from external oxygen, basically. So these are chips that are um, tried, that, that are, um, these are chips that are supposed to be anoxic and that they are being operated outside of an anaerobic chamber. And so in that case, it's very useful to carefully consider the materials that you expect to use for your chip before you embark in this long journey of trying to uh, control oxygen in one of these systems. Great, thank you. Thanks for the question, Alicia. Um, Stephen here, uh, it seems he missed a little bit of the seminar, which don't worry, Stephen, because we are going to send you the full recording. But Stephen does have a question uh, about what is the basic method by which signal transduction occurs? Signal transduction. Um, I'm not a signals guy, but Jake, do you um, have any info on that? So, uh, if you're talking in terms of the sensors, um, 
I'm not really sure what you mean by signal transduction in this context. Um, I, I don't know if you're still around to possibly clarify that, but uh, if we're talking about the sensors, um, the method that that we use is a quenching of fluorescence. So the their fluorescent um, dyes embedded in the sensors, and then based on the presence of oxygen, that signal will decay um, at a faster rate. So um, I, I don't think that's what you meant, but that's the closest thing I can sort of get to. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Um, Stephen, feel free to follow up uh, with the question if you're still around. Um, I have a question here from Reek, um, and they say, thanks for the seminar. I'm a medical student who found this really interesting as a possible diagnostic mechanism. Do you think this method has applications in, say, en enterology, where it's important to keep track of oxygen saturation for the preservation of the microbiota? Yeah, well, um, the the main application that we are aiming for with this technology in, in this case in particular is um, to use these chips as a tool for exploring biological systems and microenvironments that are just harder to access in, um, in vivo, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that there is applications for um, for oxygen sensing during during more clinical situations, for example, during surgery. Um, but the one that we are using right now is basically in order to improve drug development and improve our understanding of different pathologies that include, for example, um, gastroenterolo gastroenterological pathologies. And so, yeah, the applications are broad, and uh, it's an it's an exciting time to be working in 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 this field. Of that, um, and just to follow up with both of you uh, on Stephen, uh, that is exactly what Stephen meant. So nice job answering that, Jake. Sweet. <laughs> Uh, I have another question from Natalia, and um, she says, based on the results from these experiments, what next experiments, areas of study are you evaluating? Um, we are currently studying using this chip uh, in order to study the interaction between um, colorectal epithelial cells and microbiota, given the fact that the microbiota is fully anoxic, and uh, that correlates to the that relates to the question that I answered previously about the potential applications for gastroenterology and the boom of microbiota um, research that's that's happening right now. So that's our main application in this moment. Um, but not only that, um, not only that part of the interaction between colonic epithelial cells and microbiota, but also what goes after that interaction. So so their interaction with stromal cells like fibroblasts and with uh, vascular cells like lymphatic endothelial cells are also um, one of our interests. Great, thanks. Um, another question from Stephen. Um, okay, so what, uh, what Stephen would like to do is place one sensor on each end of a rectangular culture chamber in a microfluidic system and measure oxygen before and after in the media flow through. Is this possible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, so I'll I'll just take this one. Um, yes, absolutely, Stephen. So, and the follow-up question to that is: I see you said, would I need multiple readers? So you could do this with one reading device, and we have a fiber optic enabled reading device where you can run fiber optic cables from the device. So um, this is a pretty normal thing we do in perfusion applications, um, like in the feeding lines before and after uh, a culture chamber. And yeah, you, we could do it the same way. So you would have one fiber optic cable on the inlet, one fiber optic cable on the outlet, and you can use one reading device to monitor the oxygen, um, you know, on both sides of that device. Thanks for that, Jake. Um, okay, and uh, I, you got two for one there. Awesome, great job. Um, also, just want to let everybody know, too, there is a uh, brochure download in the handout section here. So if you are thinking about using any of the sensor technology and want to learn more and not sure of the questions to ask at the moment, uh, certainly feel free to download that handout um, and reach out to us at any time. It, does anybody else have any questions? Just give it a couple minutes here. and. Uh, Okay, I have a question from Anna. 
Anna is wondering uh, when the webinar is finished. Oh, say happy birthday to Daniel. You've been to Daniel, Daniel, it's your birthday today? Yeah. <laughs> it is. Reading, reading that question was just a surprise happy for, birthday, for, for, you know? for everybody. Oh, say happy birthday to Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Anna. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you for that tidbit of information. <laughs> best question ever. <laughs> that is best question of the day. It's fantastic. Um, well, with that, if uh, if I don't see any other questions coming through, so if there are no other questions, I would like to uh, just thank everybody again for being here. Daniel, I really want to thank you for putting this together uh, and for your research. Um, really, really pleased with how everything turned out for you. Um, and to let everybody know, um, if if you do want to try out the sensor technology, you can reach Jake. Uh, his email is there uh, at the on the screen. And also, we, we love keeping the conversation going uh, with scientists and researchers such as yourselves. So you can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, give us a like, give us a follow. Uh, we are heavily active and love engaging in these conversations um, and finding out what types of applications you're all working on. Hmm. Um, and uh, Daniel, do you have anything else for close? Yeah, I, I also wanted to uh, thank you all for facilitating this webinar. It was a very enjoyable exper experience for me, uh, both the webinar and working with your products. And so I just want to give a shout out and uh, and tell to anybody in the audience who is interested in trying this type of experiments that my experience with uh, scientific bioprocessing was phenomenal. Um, I really like the fact that there are companies that's focused in cell culture technology. And so when you have that question, they definitely have an answer for you. And their support during the whole process was also fantastic. When I started these experiments uh, only a few months ago, I was very new to the whole oxygen sensing uh, experiment. It's not it's not like my, my main field of, field of research. It's, it's a part of my research. And so I, I'm really, really um, grateful for all the support that I received. It was, it was phenomenal. It was, it definitely helped me deal with the stress of venturing into a, into a new field. So I really appreciate that. Thank you all for, for that. That's great. Thank you. And Jake, thank you too for taking the time uh, and answering some questions here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'd just like to give a shout out to Daniel too. Uh, before he said all those nice things about us, I was planning to say something anyways. Um, Daniel. <laughs> is brilliant number one and has been the most amazing person to work and collaborate with so daniel i wish you all the best in your future um and you know i hope we get the chance to work together again that'd be great thank you jake fantastic well again thank you everybody you will be hearing from us uh to get the recording of this webinar and uh, please keep a lookout for future webinars as well have a wonderful day everybody thank you cheers